Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett's brand new investor letter is out here today, folks. I want to go through this with you. I want to tell you and read to you exactly what Warren Buffett is saying here in regards to the market, in regards to his strategies, in regards to investing in general. We're going to go through it all in this video. I'm going to react to it, kind of give my opinion on anything the GOAT Warren Buffett himself has to say here, folks. I hope you enjoy this one. I'm obviously a huge fan of Warren Buffett, have been since I got in the market 2008, 2009. He was really the first person person, in my opinion, that really spoke the market in a way that you could understand and start to grasp and understand like how to build out a portfolio and how to diversify and in those sorts of things. And obviously his accomplishments speak for themselves in terms of his net worth, in terms of what he's built at Berkshire Hathaway, the quality of companies he's either, he's either bought 100% ownership in or the companies he's bought stock in over time, with, which if you didn't know, Berkshire Hathaway usually owns anywhere between 30 and 50 different stocks out there. Plus they own a ton of uh, you know complete companies. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this. As always, thank you, everybody that subscribed to the channel. I appreciate you all. If you're looking to apply to join my private wealth group, my private stock group, check out the description area. First thing I want to show here is the annual percentage change of Berkshire Hathaway versus SP500 with dividends included over time, right? And obviously, Berkshire's done phenomenal, right? That's why Warren Buffett is such a respected individual in regards to the market, right? That's why folks like myself have always looked up to him. But the thing I want to actually point out to you guys in this is not just the great returns over time, but how Buffett obviously has had some off years, right? And I think this is important. So all of us as investors, right, if you have a bad year or even two bad years, just understand, like, it could be part of the process, right? You don't, you look at right here, Buffett had a negative return in, uh, this was, what was this, uh, the 2.5% there? It looks like 1973. Then he had the uh, 48, almost lost 50% of the fund uh, of, of Berkshire. Berkshire, right? Market value in 19, no, nine, yeah, 1974, almost 50% down. That was a huge number there, right? Then had a lot of great years there, down 2.7% here, a pretty big number there, down 23.1% in 1990, 19.9% in 1999. So even though he wasn't really in, involved in a lot of tech stocks, he did get kind of hit in that situation as well, right? 31.8% down in 2008, which was, you know, around kind of what you expected for the market given that, that moment in time, right? Negative 4.7% 4 return there in 2011, negative 12.5% return in 2015. But overall, I mean, you know, this is what it's about, man. It's about be, being right more than you're being wrong. That's all I can say about that. And obviously his return over time speaks for itself versus S&P 500. Absolutely phenomenal investor. And he, one of the things I appreciate with Buffett the most is how disciplined that man stays and how in his circle of competence. Okay, let's get straight in this, guys. Okay, what we do, Charlie and I allocate your savings at Berkshire between two related forms of ownership. First, we invest in businesses that we control, usually buying 100% of each. Berkshire direct capital allocation at these subsidiaries and select the CEOs who make the day-to-day -day operating decisions, right? It's not like Warren Buffett's making the decision for some carpet company he owns or, or for Dairy Queen like they own or Fruit of the Loom or any of the other businesses or Geico. It's not like he's out there making the insurance decisions. That's not the way it works, right? When large enterprises are being managed, both trust and rules are essential. Berkshire emphasizes the former to an unusual, some would say extreme degree. Disappointments are inevitable. We are understanding about business mistakes. Our tolerance for personal misconduct is zero. In our second category of ownership, we buy publicly traded stocks through which we passively own pieces of businesses. Holding these investments, we have no say in management. Our goal in both forms of ownership is to make meaningful investments in businesses with both long-lasting favorable economic characteristics and trustworthy managers. That's key, right? Trustworthy managers. I don't know why my, my you know, uh, cursor here is messed up in this video, but it is what it is. I'm like trying to highlight certain things that it won't highlight. Please note part that particularly that we own publicly traded stocks based on our expectations about their long-term business performance. 
not because we view them as vehicles for a, an adroit purchase or sales, okay? I'm, I'm guessing he's kind of meaning like short-term, like in and out, right? Although I will say Todd and Ted seem to be a little more in that activity, which do run some money for Berkshire. It's just uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, those guys are a little, little different breed in terms of their long-term outlooks with companies. That point is crucial. Charlie and I are not stock pickers. We are business pickers. I love this right here. We are not stock pickers. We are business pickers, okay? Basically meaning we always focus on the business first. The, the fact that they happen to be stocks we're buying, it is what it is, right? And, and you know, if, if Warren Buffett's buying Apple stock, he's really buying Apple the business, right? He's thinking about it in those terms. And that's something that really resonated with me. When you buy a stock, you are buying part ownership in an actual company, okay? And you can decide the fate of the board of directors who decides the executives of that company who make the decisions for that company, okay? So you gotta understand when you buy a stock, you are now part owner of a corporation. That's why it's important to look at it from a business perspective, not just a stock perspective and a price that goes up and down each day the market's open, right? Over the years, I have made many mistakes. Consequently, our extensive collection of businesses currently consists of a few enterprises that have truly extraordinary economics, many that enjoy very good economic characteristics, and a large group that are marginal. Along the way, other businesses in which I have invested in have died, their products unwanted by the public. Capitalism has two sides. The system creates an ever-growing pile of losers while concurrently delivering a gusher of improved goods and services. They would call this phenomenon creative destruction. And I love that. And, and you know, Warren Buffett's not afraid to admit that he makes mistakes as well, right? There's no, there's no man that's in investing or business that's perfect. And I think that's something I can always try to tell the new people in the market. They think you have to be perfect. No, you don't. You don't have to be right on every stock. It's not the way it works. As long as you're far more right over a 10, 20 year span on most stocks, right? You're going to make phenomenal amounts of money in this game. As long as the list of stocks you're right on, businesses you're right on is way exceeding the ones you're wrong on. You know, you're going to make a lot of money in this game and way too many people get caught up in the short term and think you have to be right about every single decision. It's so unrealistic. It's, it's like viewing, let's say you're a sports fan, right? And you thinking like, like your football team has to win every single game. It's not the way it works. They're not going to win every single game, right? But as long as they win more than they lose, and as long as they win a few Super Bowls here and there, you're going to be a very happy fan. That's the bottom line. And so you as an individual stock picker, it's just very important that you're right more than you're wrong, okay? And you're, you're making money at the end of the day. That's what counts in this game. Our advantage of our publicly traded segment is that uh, basically it becomes easy to buy pieces of wonderful businesses at wonderful prices. It's crucial to understand that stocks often trade at truly foolish prices, both high and low. Efficient markets exist only in textbooks. Boom. Preach. Preach. <laughs> Preach. This is efficient markets only exist in textbooks. I wish every person on Wall Street read that sentence right there because they all think like it's supposed to go this way or go that way and it doesn't work that way. It never has and it never will. It'd be amazing if, you know, you could just know exactly when the market's going to bottom and exactly where the market's going to top and exactly when the market goes down. It doesn't work that way and never has. And anybody that's trying to predict where a market's bottom at or any of that, it's just a foolish game in the end. It doesn't work like that, okay? In truth, marketable stocks and bonds are baffling. Their behavior usually understandable only in retrospect. Only in retrospect. Such an amazing point. Let that point hit and marinate there for a moment, okay? Because I can tell you, in every single situation, at least since I've been in the market the past 15 years, many times stocks will make moves that it doesn't, doesn't seem like it should make at that particular time. And then all of a sudden, six months, nine months, 12 months go by, and you're like, I get it. There's so many stocks that over time made what I thought were very, very silly moves, and the stock price has moved up a ton. And I was like, that's ridiculous. And then all of a sudden, that company's earnings just came in and were absolutely phenomenal. And I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. Like, I see why that, 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 that happened, right? Other times, it's going to happen the other way where you're going to see a stock make a silly move, and you're like, that seems like a bubble. And it is a bubble, okay? But many times, you're not going to get that answer right then and there. Like, you want that answer today. It's not going to give you that answer today. It will give you that answer in six or nine months from now. And then it will all make sense. And you're like, I get it now. 
People were a lot of people were baffled when stocks started skyrocketing in 2009, when the economy was still in shambles and it was getting worse actually, and yet the market was moving up and went up and up. And people were like, "What is going on here?" Well, little did they know, earnings of the company started to come back at the very end of 2009 and into 2010, and actually started performing quite strong for many of the strongest companies, and then it started to make sense why the market was coming back. So, a lot of times it doesn't make sense in the short term; it makes sense over time. Controlled businesses are a different breed. They sometimes command ridiculously higher prices than justified, but are almost never available at bargain valuations unless under duress. The owner of a controlled business gives no thought to selling at a panic type valuation. Boom, exactly, okay? Private, you know, that's just not the way it works. You know, stocks, people panicking, usually like a privately owned business, it just doesn't work that way. At this point, a report card from me is appropriate. In 58 years of Berkshire's management, most of my capital allocation decisions have been no better than so-so. In some cases, also bad moves by me have been rescued by very large uh, doses of luck. <laughs> Remember our escapes from near disasters in U.S. air in Solomon? I certainly do. Okay, And those are way old school, and uh, I doubt very many people watching this video know about those, and that's perfectly fine. Our, satisf our satisfactory results have been the product of dozens of truly good decisions that would be one in every five years. Interesting. And sometimes forgotten advantage that favors long-term investors such as Berkshire. Let's take a peek behind the curtain. Ooh, the secret sauce. In August 1994, yes, 1994, Berkshire completed its seven-year purchase of 400 million shares of Coca-Cola we now own. The total cost of that was $1.3 billion. There was a very meaningful sub, uh, sum at Berkshire, very significant investment, right? The cash dividend we received from Coke in 1994 was 75 million dollars, which is still an insane number, right? 75 million dollars, like that's beautiful. By 2022, the dividend had increased to 704 million dollars. <laughs> Growth occurred every year, just as certain as birthdays. All Charlie and I were required to do was cash Coke's quarterly dividend checks. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's a beautiful way of putting it. We expect that those checks are highly likely to grow. American Express is much the same story. Berkshire's purchases of Amex were essentially completed in 1995 and coincidentally also cost $1.3 billion. Annual dividends received from this investment have grown from $41 million to $302 million. Imagine making $302 million a year from an investment, uh, just in dividends alone. <laughs> Holy smoke, is that's no joke, it's okay. Basically, Berkshire is getting many, many billions of dollars just in dividends from stocks each year. That's just, man, that's incredible. Those checks, too, seem highly likely to increase. These dividend gains though pleasing, are far from spectacular, but they bring with them the important gain in stock prices. At year-end, our Coke investment was valued at $25 billion, while Amex was basically $22 billion. Oh my gosh, you gotta be flipping my flapjacks. And both of those investments were $1.3 billion each. Just insane okay think about the dividend money they're collecting and how much those stocks are worth now and not like super complicated like i know i can't understand american express i can't understand coca-cola come on man each holding now accounts for roughly five percent of berkshire's net worth akin to its waiting long ago assume for a moment I had made a similarly sized investment mistake in the 1990s, one that flatlined and simply retained its $1.3 billion of value in 2022. An example would be a high-grade 30-year bond. That disappointing investment would now represent an insignificant 0.3% of Berkshire's net worth and would be delivering to us an unchanged $80 million or so of annual income. The lesson for investors, the weeds wither away in significance as the flowers bloom. Key. Let that sink in, man. That's beautiful, okay? That should be an Instagram caption, okay? Warren Buffett's out here doing Instagram captions before Instagram captions were even a thing, okay? Over time, it takes just a few winners to work wonders. Oh, yes. Preach again, Mr. Buffett. I've seen that in my own, my own investments. A hundred percent, man. All it takes is a few winners to work wonders. And I got some of those babies, okay? And 
thank goodness for those because they, they, they do a lot of damage to, to knock out some ones that just don't go quite right, right? And yes, it helps to start early and live into your 90s as well. Yes, uh, that's true. The past year in brief, Berkshire had a good year in 2022. The company's operating earnings, our term for income calculated using generally accepted accounting principles gap, exclusive of capital gains or losses from equity holdings, set a record of $30.8 billion. Charlie and I focus on this operational figure and urge you to do so as well. The gap figure, absent of our adjustment fluctuations, wildly in uh, whatever, uh, at every reporting date. Note its behavior in 2022, which is no way unusual, right? And if you look at a gap basis, it's all over the flip and flap jack in place. And I think they messed up gap reporting along, you know, many, many, year, many years ago when they made this change. And now you had to basically take into account if your stocks went up or down, like if you own stocks like a Berkshire. And so it makes their earnings look all over the place. But check out their operating earnings, okay? Much more consistent, much more understandable. The gap earnings are 100% misleading when viewed quarterly or even annually. Preach, Buffett. Preach 100%. I back you on that 100%, sir. Capital gains, to be sure, have been hugely important to Berkshire over the past decade, and we expect them to be meaningfully positive in future decades. But their quarter-to-quarter -quarter, uh, gyrations regularly and mindlessly headlined by media totally misinform investors. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 100%. A second positive development for Berkshire last year was their purchase of this uh, corporation, okay, Allegheny Corporation, a property casual insurer ca uh, captained by Joe Brandon. <laughs> Come on, man. Not that name. Not that name. Come on, man. Oh, gosh. I've worked with Joe in the past, and he understands both Berkshire and insurance. Allegheny uh, delivers special value to us because Berkshire's unmatched financial strength allows its insurance subsidiaries to follow valuable and enduring investment strategies unavailable to virtually all competitors. Interesting. Aided by Allegheny, and I might not be pronouncing that right, so I do apologize. I'm not the best at pronouncing uh, words that aren't the, uh, the most normal words. Let's just call it that. I think everybody that watched my videos understands that. I appreciate you guys, okay? And uh, please forgive me for those that uh, maybe don't usually see my videos. Our insurance float increased during 2022 from $147 billion to $164 billion. With disciplined underwriting, these funds have a decent chance of being cost-free over the same time. Since purchasing our first property casual insurer in 1967, Berkshire's float has increased 8,000-fold <gasps> through acquisitions, operations, and innovations. Though not recognized in our financial statements, this float has been an extraordinary asset for Berkshire. New shareholders can get an understanding of its value by reading our annually updated explanation of the float on page A2. A very minor gain in the per share intrinsic value took place in 2022 through Berkshire's share repurchase as well, as are similar moves at Apple and American Express, both significant investees of ours. At Berkshire, we directly increased your interest in our unique collection of businesses by repurchasing 1.2% of the company's outstanding shares. At Apple and Amex, repurchases increased Berkshire's ownership a bit without any cost to us. Beautiful, beautiful. The math isn't complicated. When the share count goes down, your interest in many businesses goes up. Every small bit helps. If repurchases are made at value accretive prices, just as surely when a company overpays for repurchases, the, con the continuing shareholders lose. At such times, gains flow only to the selling shareholders and to the friendly but ex expensive investment banker who recommend the foolish purchases. <laughs> That's beautiful, okay? Buffett's usually very nice, but, uh, you know, sometimes he throws a few shots here and there. Let's just put it that way. Gains from value accretive repurchases, it should be emphasized, benefit all owners in every respect. Imagine if you will... The uh, three fully informed is shareholders of a local auto dealership, one of whom manages a business. Imagine further that one of these passive owners wishes to sell his interest back to the company at a price attractive to the two continuing shareholders. 
When completed, his transaction harmed anyone? Is a manager somehow favored or the, over the continuing passive uh, owners? Has the public been hurt? When you are told that all repurchases are harmful to shareholders or to the country or to particular, uh, particularly beneficial to CEOs, you are listening to either economic illiterate ooh, or a silver-tongued you say that word for me. Thank you. Okay. Now this is interesting folks, because this is almost, this right here is getting a little political. You've probably heard what Joe Biden's been talking about. Okay. You've been talk, hearing what obviously the uh, current party in the office has been talking about. They've been demonizing share buybacks in a major meaningful way. Okay. And he's not the only one in that party, right? But he's the president of the United States. These folks have been going after specifically oil and gas companies recently for all their big share buybacks. I know Chevron just announced some, I think it was $75 billion buyback. And so this is very intriguing because if you know Warren Buffett, you know Warren Buffett is a Democrat. And so the fact that he is basically taking shots here, he just called the president of the United States economic illiterate. Straight up, without saying a name there. That's exactly what he just said. That's interesting. Very interesting. Almost endless details of Berkshire's 2022 operations are laid out on pages K33 through K66. Charlie and I, along with many Berkshire shareholders, enjoy pouring over many facts and figures laid out in that section. These pages are not, however, required reading. These are, or excuse me, there are many Berkshire uh, cent, uh, centimillionaires and yes, billionaires who have never studied our financial figures. They simply know Charlie and I, along with our families and close friends, continue to have and uh, very significant investments in Berkshire, and they trust us to treat their money as we do our own, and that is a promise we can make. Finally, an important war warning. Even the operating earnings figure that we favor can easily be manipulated by managers who wish to do so. Such tampering is often thought as of as sophisticated by uh, CEOs, right? Directors and their advisors. Reporters and analysts embrace its existence as well. Beating expectations is heralded it as a managerial triumph. That's the truth, okay? That's the truth. I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, you watch CNBC and it's earnings coming out and everybody's talking about, did the company beat or did they miss? That's the first thing. Did they beat? Did they miss? Right? That activity is disgusting. <gasps> Whoa. Okay. It requires no talent to manipulate numbers. Only a deep desire to deceive is required. Bold imagination accounting, as a CEO once described his deception to me, has become one of the shames of capitalism. Interesting, okay? Wow, wow, wow. I think it's just another reason why Charlie specifically hates non-GAAP. <laughs> he hates non-GAAP, where you can kind of, you know, take this number out, take that number out. Wow. 58 years and a few figures. In 1965, Berkshire was a one-trick pony. The owner was a vulnerable but doomed New England textile operation with that business on his death march. Berkshire needed an immediate fresh start. Looking back, I was slow to recognize the severity of its problems. And then came a stroke of good luck. National identity became available in 1967, and we shifted our resources toward insurance and other non-textile operations. Good move, Warren Buffett. Thus began our journey to 2023, a bumpy road involving a combination of continuous savings by our owners, that is by their retaining earnings, the power of compounding, our avoidance of major mistakes, and most important of all, the American tailwind. America would have done fine without Berkshire. The reverse is not true. 100%, 100%, right? America would have been just fine without Berkshire Hathaway, right? And without Warren Buffett. I think Berkshire has done a lot of good for the American. I think Warren Buffett has done a lot of good for the United States of America, right? But the fact is, like, Berkshire couldn't have had that success if the United States hasn't had the success it has over the past many, many decades. And we can't ever forget that, right? Can't ever look past that. We're, you know, we're all just byproducts of, you know, how our country does over time. 
Berkshire now enjoys major ownership in an unmatched collection of huge and diversified businesses. Let's take a look at the 5,000 or publicly held companies that trade daily on the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, and relative venues. Within this group is housed a member of the S&P 500 index, the, an elite collection of large and well-known American corporations. In aggregate, the 500 earned $1.8 trillion in 2021. $1.8 trillion they earned. Incredible number. Just incredible number. I don't yet have the final results of 2022. Using, therefore, the 2021 figures, only 128 of the 500, including Berkshire itself, earned $3 billion or more. Indeed, 23 lost money. Man, lost money in 2021. That's interesting. Being the SP 500, you lost money. Holy smokes, that's, that's a feat in itself that year. Okay, Maybe this past year, but in 2021. Uh. At year end 2022, Berkshire was the largest owner of eight of these giants, American Express, Bank of America, Chevron, Coca-Cola, HP, Moody's, Occidental Petroleum, and Paramount Global. That's a flex. If you want to talk about real flex, you want to talk about flexing, flexing, there's, there's levels to flexing, okay? This man just said, we're the largest owner of eight huge giants in the S&P 500. <laughs> That's incredible. In addition to those eight investees, Berkshire owns 100% of Burlington Northern Santa Fe and 92% of BH Energy, each with earnings that exceed $3 billion mark noted above the $5.9 billion at Bur uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe and $4.3 billion at BHE. Were, those co were these companies publicly owned, they would replace those two that represent uh, in, in the 500. All told, our 10 controlled and non-controlled behemoths leave Berkshire more broadly aligned with the country's economic future that is the case at, at any other U.S. company. This calculation leaves aside fiduciary operations such as pension funds and investment companies. In addition, Berkshire's insurance operations, though conducted through many individually managed subsidiaries, have value comparable to Burlington Northern and BHE. Mm. As far for the future, Berkshire will always hold a boatload of cash. That's a great way of putting it. A boatload of cash in U.S. Treasury bills, along with a wide array of businesses. We will, we will also avoid behavior that could result in any uncomfortable cash needs at in inconvenient times, including financial panics and unprecedented insurance losses. Because remember, they got that huge Geico business, right? And many other businesses that are in relation to Geico. Our CEO will always be the chief risk officer, a task that is irresponsible to delegate, 100%. Additionally, our future CEOs will have a significant part of their net worth in Berkshire shares, bought with their own money. Interesting. And yes, our shareholders will continue to save and prosper by retaining earnings. At Berkshire, there will be no finish line. I absolutely love that. I absolutely love that. Some surprising facts about federal taxes. During the decade ending 2021, the United States Treasury received about $32.3 trillion in taxes, while it spent $43.9 trillion. Though economists, politicians, and many of the public have opinions about the consequences of a huge imbalance, Charlie and I plead ignorance and firmly believe that the near-term economic and market forecasts are worse than useless. <sighs> wow. Our job is to manage Berkshire's operations and finances in a manner that will achieve an acceptable result over time and that will preserve the company's unmatched staying power when financial panics and severe worldwide recessions occur. Berkshire also offers some modest protection from runway infl runaway inflation. Nice. But this uh, attribute is far from perfect. Huge and entrenched financial deficits have consequences. The $32 trillion of revenue that was garnered by the Treasury through individual in income taxes, 48%, Social Security and related receipts, 34.5%, corporate income tax payments, 8.5%, and a wide variety of lesser level, uh, levies. Berkshire's contribution via the corporate income tax was $32 billion during the decade, almost exactly a tenth of 1% of all the money the treasury collected. That's interesting. <laughs> it's pretty insignificant, right? And that means brace yourself. 
Had there been roughly 1,000 taxpayers in the U.S. matching Berkshire's payment, no other business nor any of the country's 131 million households would have been needed to pay any taxes to the federal government, not a dime. Millions, billions, and trillions. We all know the world's but the sums involved are almost impossible to comprehend. Let's put it in physical dimensions to the numbers. If you convert $1 million into newly printed $100 bills, you'll have a stack that reaches your chest. <laughs> Perform the same exercise with $1 billion. This is getting exciting. The stack reaches about three-fourths of a mile into the sky. <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, picture a, tr a track is uh, basically a fourth of a mile, right? So picture an entire big track, but the entire track's just standing up, right? And uh, you've got, you know, three of those tracks on top of each other. Like, that's just insane. Finally, imagine piling up $32 billion, the total of Berkshire's 20, uh, 2012 to 2021 federal income tax payments. Now the stack grows to more than 21 million, or excuse me, 21 million, 21 miles in height about three times the level at which commercial airplanes usually cruise. <laughs> That's insane, man. That's insane. When it comes to federal taxes, individuals who own Berkshire can unequivocally state, I gave, <laughs> wait, uh, I gave at the office. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> at Berkshire, we hope and expect to pay as much or more in taxes during the next decade. We owe the country no less. America's dynamic dynamism has made huge uh, contribution to whatever success Berkshire has achieved, a contribution Berkshire will always need. We count on the American tailwind, and though it has been beclaimed from time to time, its propelling force has always returned. I've been investing for 80 years. Holy smokers. <sighs> that ain't no dang jokers. Oh my gosh. Warren Buffett makes me feel young. That's all I can say about that, man. I've been investing for 15 years, and it feels like 500 years. And I can just tell you, I feel so young. I feel so dang young, man, when I hear 80 years. Holy smokers, that's no joke. More than one-third of the country's lifetime. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Despite our citizens' uh, 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 penchant, almost enthusiasm for self-criticism uh, self, uh, and self-doubt, I have yet to see a time, I'm still trying to fathom the, the one third of the country's lifetime, like that's just like crazy to me. I have yet to see a time when it made sense to make a long-term bet against America, 100%. And I doubt very much that any reader of this letter will have a different experience in the future. Nothing beats having a great partner. Charlie and I pretty much think alike, right? Uh, but it takes me to a, a, a page to explain it. He sums it up in one sentence. His version, moreover, is always more clearly and re uh, reasoned and also more artfully and sometimes might build, uh, add bluntly state it. Here are a few things on his thoughts. The world is full, full of foolish gamblers and they will not do as well as the patient investor, right? And you have kind of two groups. You have folks that uh, just, you know, they just literally just gambling on, on, you know, stocks or whatever it is, and they can't get out of that mindset, right? And you have other folks that sometimes we get pulled into making gambling decisions, right? And it's up to us to kind of pull us out of that. And, um, you know, if you're in the market long enough, you're going to go some bad routes and you kind of take it, take your game maybe sometimes to levels of like, oh man, I'm taking more gambles than investments at this point in time, right? And any investment's a gamble, whether you buy Coca-Cola or American Express, everything's a gamble. But it's just a, a question of like, are, are you playing as the house? Or are you playing as the uh, player, right? And I think Warren Buffett does a great job of being the, the house at the casino rather than the player at the casino, right? And it's up for us that are mere mortals to make sure we don't go too far over there because it's, it's always grabbing for our attention. And uh, especially in really hot markets, it grabs for our attention even more. You know, spec stocks, SPACs, it all, it grabs for our attention more and more and more. And we have to try to fight that urge to go over there. And it's a, it's a difficult thing. It's absolutely a very difficult thing. If you don't see the world the way it is, it's like judging something through distorted lenses. All I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there. <laughs> and related thought, early on, write your, your, your desired obituary, and they behave accordingly. That's interesting thought. That's very interesting thought. Okay. And it's, that's out there, man. If you don't care whether you are rational or not, you won't work on it. Then you will stay irrational and get lousy results. 
Patience can be learned. Having a long attention span and the ability to concentrate on one thing for a long time is a huge advantage. Oh my gosh, tell that to the next generation on the come up right now, man. The TikTok generation. I wish they, yeah, you know, I think they're being pulled in some some directions that is, uh, if anything, it's eating their attention span worse than ever, right? And uh, I was even talking about my wife recently. We were talking about um, how some of these kids shows now, there's so many cuts and edits and boom, 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 and uh, so much going on that it, uh, it, it's, it could be potentially like ruining even like children's like attention spans because it's so much like moving and, um, and whatnot. And we're just like, like thinking about, geez, man, like, you know, concentration, attention spans, like that's what all the most successful people are. And I can tell you probably some of the most successful people of the next generation will be the ones that have longer attention spans and, and can, can do very in-depth research and listen to important things and stuff like that. Right. And I think about listening to conference calls. I think about reading annual reports. These are things that take up a great deal of time and attention, right? They're reading, reading through financial documents. Like this isn't a TikTok video. Like this is, this is in-depth stuff, right? And so, you know, at the end of the day, I think the ones that have those longer attention spans and have the right kind of mindsets, I think those are going to be the ones that ultimately become the next huge winners of the next generation. You can learn a lot from dead people. Read, uh, read of the deceased and you will admire and detest. Don't bail away in a sinking boat. If you can swim to one that is seaworthy, <laughs> a, <laughs> a, great, a great company keeps working after you are not. The, a mediocre company won't do that. Preach. Warren and I don't focus on the froth of the market. We seek out, to, we seek out good long-term investments and stubbornly hold them for a long time. Ben Graham said, quote, day to day, the stock market is a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine, end quote. If you keep making something more valuable, the some, then some wise person is going to notice and start buying. I like that. I like that. I like that, man. There's no such thing as a 100% sure thing when investing. Yes. Love that. Thus, thus the use of leverage is dangerous. A string of wonderful numbers times zero will always equal zero. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Don't count on getting rich twice. Oh, man. So good. So good. You don't, have, and it, you know, margin just it wrecks so many people. It, it's, it's given me huge problems in the past, 2015 specifically. It did so much damage to me. You know, margin is just, the, you know, it seems like it's just like so perfect. And then you get into it and you just realize it's hell. It's absolute hell. The more you get into it, the more you realize it's hell. You don't, however, need to own a lot of things in order to get rich. You have to keep learning if you want to become a great investor. When the world changes, you must change. Warren and I hated railroad stocks for decades, but the world changed. And finally, the country had four huge railroads of vital importance to the American economy. We were slow to recognize the change, but better late than never. I like that. I like that. You know, and I love just the fact that these gentlemen are just, you know, their character. I think, it, I think it's a character trait when you can admit, you know, you're not always going to be right, right? You're going to make mistakes. It is what it is. Like, you know, you have to move on in business and investing. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have failures and you got to learn from those and move on. That's it. Finally, I'll add two short sentences by Charlie that have been the uh, decision clinchers for decades. Warren, think more about it. You're smart and I'm right. <laughs> and so it goes. I never have a phone call with Charlie without learning something. And while he makes me think, he also makes me laugh. I will add to Charlie's list a rule of my own. Find a very smart, high-grade partner, preferably slightly older than you, and then listen very carefully to what he says. I love that. I, yes, yes. The problem is for a lot of folks, it's, it's hard to find that, right? It really is. A family gathering in Omaha. Uh, so basically, he's talking about, you know, shareholder, you know, meeting and whatnot. So absolutely love that. You know, love to just hear Warren Buffett's perspectives on this, Charlie Munger's perspectives. Obviously, just, you know, so much success from them over time. I think they, I think they, I think those gentlemen have just a lot of wise words about investing, about life in general. And the more you get into investing over time, the more you realize many of the lessons you learn are applied to life as well. 
And so, um, yeah, I just, I, I love that, man. So thank you everybody joining me as always. Wow, 39 minute video, I appreciate y'all. Thanks so much, thanks for being subscribed here. And um, yeah, man, just, I, I love that type of stuff. And I just, it's Warren Buffett, he's one of those that just hopes around uh, forever and ever and ever, man. Uh, Cause he's just, he's just, um, just pure greatness in, 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 every, in every sense in my opinion. So anyways, much love and have a great day.